Oh, oh geez. <laughs> you weren't supposed to see us like this. Please enjoy this drone clip that my friends and I took a month and a half ago in Italy in anticipation for this video. So, I hit 100,000 subscribers. Wow. If you told me a year ago that I would have this right now, I don't want to make too big a deal out of the plaque itself, but what it represents. Yes, thousands of hours of work, but more importantly, connections that I have made to you guys, and it just, it really means a lot to me. So thank you for subscribing. So anyway, I've really been noodling on what type of video to make in honor of 100,000 subscribers for a while now. And I finally landed on doing a deep, deep analyzation of my YouTube channel from start to finish. Well, not to finish, because I'm still doing it, but what I did right, what I did wrong, and of course, I'm gonna throw in tons of tips and tricks on how I did it and how you guys can do it too, because I want this to be helpful. And stay till the end, because I'm gonna summarize everything and all the tips that I have for you guys, and I'm also gonna do an exciting, yet unconventional little giveaway, so you'll see what I mean. Also, new haircut. Thank you for noticing. I. Yes, yes, once again, thank you. All right, guys, this is a long video. So before jumping into the thick of it, I wanna take one minute to thank today's sponsor, Grammarly. Grammarly is a digital writing assistant that provides comprehensive suggestions to help you improve your writing and ensure cohesive communication at work. For me, I still control every step of my content creation process from writing brand emails to script writing, and this is a time-intensive process. And this is where Grammarly comes in clutch. They have a free version, which provides comprehensive spelling, punctuation, and grammar suggestions so you can feel more confident that your writing is mistake free and also a premium version which provides full sentence rewrites to make your writing more clear and concise having these tools really helps me save time and work more efficiently when i am multitasking specifically when i'm switching between writing brand emails and script writing grammarly is free to download and it also works wherever you work like in google docs or in emails so power through work more efficiently and confidently with the help of grammarly today it is literally free so why not the best time to do it is now go to grammarly.com taylor to sign up for a free account and if you want extra features upgrade to grammarly premium for 20 percent off thank you grammarly for sponsoring this video and now back to the thick of it all right let's jump in so i started my youtube channel a little less than two years ago i uploaded my very first video on august 20th 2020 and since then my channel has gone through what i consider four phases but let's back up why did i start my youtube channel why did i start it within the niche that i did and so on so this is my story it's september 2019 it's the fall semester of my senior year of college and things are looking pretty great. I secured an offer to work at a management consulting firm upon my graduation. I accepted that offer and I also had the luxury of choosing from a number of start dates. Instead of starting right after graduating college, I decided to choose the latest possible start date. I wanted to take a break, you know, I'd officially been going to school for like 19 consecutive years. I had enough money saved up for my two previous internships and from money that I saved while working in high school and I was going to travel the world. And then... Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. I graduated college in May of 2020 with grand plans to travel the world, and I could no longer do that for obvious reasons. So here I was faced with six months before starting my job in the middle of COVID. I flew home to Los Angeles, where I'm from, and I dumped out the suitcases that essentially contained my whole entire life onto my childhood bedroom floor. And I realized how much I dreaded cleaning up that pile, not just because I'm lazy, and I am lazy, but I just realized it was mainly clothes that, you know, largely I was never gonna wear again. Most of the clothes, I had thrifted in the first place, so I wasn't looking at a huge money deficit. But instead of redonating it, I figured I could probably sell some of this. And then I downloaded Poshmark, which is an app where you can buy and sell new and used clothing, not sponsored. I started listing all of my clothes that I was no longer interested in. And the second that I made my very first sale, which was for a whopping $5, by the way, I was hooked. Long story short, since this video is about my YouTube journey and not my reselling journey, I eventually got to the point where I was thrifting clothes from Goodwill and selling them online for profit up until the point where I was making about $2,700 per month in revenue from this fun little side hustle that I stumbled upon. And all along the way, I was primarily learning how to become a better reseller through YouTube videos, where other resellers would talk about what brands tend to sell for a decent amount of money, which brands to avoid, and other tips and tricks. And then, as it does to most people with YouTube channels, it occurred to me, hey, 
I could do this. I know enough about this side hustle where I could talk about it confidently in front of a camera. So I did. Enter phase one of my YouTube channel. And on August 20th, 2020, I released my first video talking about how I made money selling clothes on Poshmark in quarantine. All right, tips incoming. I not only published this video on YouTube, of course, I also put it on my Facebook page for my friends and family to see because I knew that the YouTube algorithm would not push it out to strangers yet because I was brand new to the platform. And this is where my first two tips come in. Tip number one, if you are thinking about starting a YouTube channel, you have to talk about something that you give a shit about. Seriously, if you're passionate about it, one, that passion will shine through and you will just have a better presence on camera. Plus, you'll have the confidence to talk about it since it's something that you know a lot about. I say this because at one point during my senior year of college, I half jokingly said to a friend of mine that I should start a cooking YouTube channel. This friend is someone I'm very close to and so he just started laughing in my face. Like actually started laughing and said, why would you start a cooking YouTube channel? You don't even like cooking that much. And he was right. So this is what reselling gave me. It was something that I loved. Like I was actually addicted to it. So I came in with enough confidence and expertise on the subject. And another reason you have to talk about something you're passionate about is that you will be more likely to sustain making videos about that topic. Because once you start making YouTube videos, you can never really stop so long as your goal is to continue growing on the platform. So if you make videos about something random that you don't really care about, you're probably gonna just get bored and quit. So tip number two, I think you should share your very first video everywhere. Like I said, I put my first video on my Facebook page. Like, how embarrassing, you know? However, if your goal is for lots and lots of people to see you, you have to start with the people that actually kind of know you and will watch you. Even people you were friends with in elementary school will click because it's kind of weird, right? Like not everyone has the balls to start a YouTube channel. And I'm very serious about this tip. I think my video would have got close to zero views if I had not pushed it out to the people that at least peripherally knew me. All right, boom, case in point. This is the first seven days of analytics for my very first video ever. I got 500 views on that video in my first week. 44 on the first day, 29, 165. Again, Again, this almost is entirely because I posted this video on Facebook. 72.5% of the traffic came from there. Also, I posted on Instagram, so there you go. So reselling is what gave me my start. It was the niche on YouTube that I felt confident enough to enter. Also, quick interlude to say that for the majority of this video, it might sound very calculated, like I was just going for what would get me views. It really wasn't that calculated. Instead, I just made videos on something I was passionate about and the views followed. That being said, it was always in the back of my mind how I could scale this. I could scale my reselling business by hiring people and outsourcing portions of the process, but how could I really scale the videos? How could I bring them to the next level and eventually have a big enough audience where I felt comfortable venturing into more lifestyle content and broader business topics outside of reselling? And I started thinking about this as soon as I found out how much I loved making videos, how much more I loved it than reselling. And that's saying something because like I said, I was addicted to reselling. <laughs> Thumbs up if you're enjoying so far. So I made these reselling videos for the first three months of my channel and during this time I amassed 448 subscribers. And I was really happy with that because the growth was not linear. It was really starting to pick up at the end there of that three month period. And I was looking at hitting a thousand subscribers in the next couple months, at which point I had loosely planned on branching out a bit with my content. Enter my next tip, which is one way that I think I gained some of those early subscribers. And that is by commenting on other YouTubers videos, but not just any YouTubers. I found ones that I really liked and whose content I found valuable. That seems obvious, but I just mean don't go commenting on Logan Paul's videos or these huge viral videos because you're not really gonna engage with the audience or that creator and it's just, yeah, find YouTubers that you like. So for me, the other YouTubers whose videos I commented on came from two groups of people mainly. The first group being other small creators within my reselling niche. We would comment on each other's videos and support each other. And the second group was larger creators whose content I found valuable. So for these people, I would leave a genuine comment on what I found helpful in their video, or I would just leave a funny comment. It's just a good way to get your face out there and to start interacting with creators and other people who you eventually might wanna have as your own audience. I actually went back just this week and looked at old comments that I left on other videos and Kind of embarrassing, but also cute. <laughs> but one of the comments that I left is what changed everything. Enter phase two of my channel. On one fateful day, I left a comment on one of Graham Stephan's videos. For those who don't know who Graham Stephan is, he is the biggest personal finance YouTuber of all time. I think of all time, yeah. I left a silly comment on one of his videos, something about grabbing the popcorn, smashing the like button. Anyway, Graham saw my comment and DM'd me on Instagram asking if I would wanna come on his podcast as a blind date for his podcast co-host and video editor, Jack, because he thought it would be a funny concept for the show. Bit of an awkward situation for reasons I don't need to get into now, but I went on the podcast and had I think a great conversation with them. Once that podcast went live, I had 5,000 subscribers by the end of the week from 448 to 5,000. 
my mind was blown. And to this day, I am so grateful to Graham and Jack for that boost because it gave me the freedom to do what I planned on doing even sooner, which was to branch out with a type of content that I made. However, this new audience that I amassed inorganically also presented new challenges. First of all, these new audience members who came over from the podcast came from Graham, so they were almost entirely men who were acutely interested in personal finance. Yes, I'm also interested in personal finance. One of my degrees is in economics from Wharton. I diligently invest a large portion of my income every month. I like to stay up to date on what's going on in the market, but it was never what I solely wanted my channel to focus on. But with this new audience, I felt like I had to cater to them, otherwise they would drop off. But I also knew that I still had to make videos on what I was passionate about because it wouldn't be sustainable otherwise. Remember my number one tip? So I did what I thought was a happy medium between my usual reselling content and personal finance content, and that was this video. How I profit $110 per hour online in my 20s. I did what I'd been hoping to do, which was to take my reselling content to the next level in some way. So instead of only talking about what things I sold that week or what brands were doing well for me, I timed every single step to the second of my reselling process from thrifting the clothes to photographing the clothes to listing them to shipping them. And I analyzed my sell-through rate to arrive at exactly how much money I was profiting per hour of my labor while working at a realistically efficient pace. I created a detailed Excel model to arrive at this number and I loved it. So the intention of this video was to cater to my new audience while staying true to something I was passionate about. But even though that video did well, I knew I wasn't gonna spend that long on each new video from there on out or cater each video to my new audience. So instead, I started throwing a lot of different types of videos at the wall to see what would stick. From some Q&A videos where my audience could get to know me a little bit better, to some travel stories, to a couple day in the life vlogs. It was all a bit random and honestly, I felt pretty directionless at this time. I actually lost subscribers during a lot of my upload days because I was putting out content that Graham's audience didn't care to see. And I get it, you know, I saw that coming. But this is something that I would say I almost did wrong or that I definitely could have improved. And that was that I put out these sort of random videos that did not deliver a ton of value or play to my strengths. And we will get into what I mean by that very soon. So even though this phase was a net positive, and again, I'm very grateful for that boost that I had early on, it definitely left me having to figure out my own voice and how to grow my channel organically from there on out. So I really only have one tip associated with this phase because I totally recognize that it was completely by luck that I was invited on their podcast. But this one tip I think is very important and it's something you can control and that is to respond to every single comment. When you're small and you can still manage reading every single one, take the time to respond. For me, it's a win-win to this day because it's one of my favorite things to do, one of my favorite parts about having a YouTube channel and that is actually connecting with you guys on a deeper level. And I think the best way to do that is by responding. <laughs> so not only do you get to make those connections, but it also drives engagement on your videos. So it's a win-win. And even though it's too many to respond to now, I still respond to as many as I can. Okay, so after making a decent amount of these fun, but kind of random videos, I really sat down and evaluated what to do next. Yes, I had 5,000 subscribers, but again, they were not organically my audience members. And I eventually saw the growth of my channel come to a complete halt. So I thought about what can I talk about and offer to the world that other people can't. What are my competitive advantages that I bring to the table? Two main things came to mind. One, I went to an Ivy League university and studied at the best undergrad business school in the world. Sounds cringy and boastful even saying it. I know, I agree but it is a competitive advantage. And two, I was gonna start working as a management consultant, which is a pretty sought after profession. One might also say that I had some other soft skills going for me, but that feels weird for me to declare and that's for you guys to decide. I really was hesitant to make videos about these two topics in the beginning because I know how easily it can come off as braggy. However, I did have to work very hard to obtain these two things. I had done it successfully. And so I figured I could help others do it too. Enter phase three, the longest phase to date. Upon analyzing the unique things that I could bring to the table, I made a video about my experience at Wharton and if I thought it was worth it. I talked about why I went into management consulting and how I got into an Ivy League university more broadly. These three videos kickstarted a new phase of growth for me, both in terms of views and subscribers that came to me organically. And this is for two main reasons, which will translate into two tips as well. The first we already touched on, and that is to talk about something you have a competitive advantage in. Whether you think so or not, you're better at something than the average person, slash you have a unique 
perspective that you can bring. Now, this competitive advantage might not be something quite as concrete as having gone to an Ivy League university as an example. It can certainly be more intangible. For instance, you might be funnier than the average person, so you can make funny reaction videos and build an audience that way. You might speak multiple languages, so you can make a language channel if you feel passionate about that. You might be really good at fishing, so you could make a channel teaching your techniques or whatever it might be. See, now that's a channel I could use because every time I go fishing, I do a whole lot more fishing than catching. So that's one tip, but I do wanna keep it real with you guys and say that in making these Ivy League videos, I definitely compromised a little bit on making content that I was super passionate about. Sure, I had a great experience at Penn and it was fun to relive it through making this video, but was I super stoked to talk about the things that I did in high school six years ago to get in? No, not really. <laughs> Similarly, yeah, I was excited to start my consulting job, but was I super passionate about reliving all of the hard work that I had to put in to get that job and then impart that knowledge in a video? Not really, but I knew that I could help people. This brings me to my next tip, which is perhaps the most important one of the video, and that is to deliver value. I cannot stress this enough. I firmly believe that if you are not delivering value most of the time, whether that be literally teaching something new or providing entertainment or something in between, you will have a hard time growing your channel. Of course, there are always exceptions, but this is for the most part true and you will hear any other YouTuber say the same thing. Even to this day, when I make silly New York City vlogs and try to provide entertainment, I also try to teach something, no matter how small, in just about every single video. So back to this phase. I put out the Ivy League and consulting content and coasted for a while, throwing in some silly lifestyle videos now and then to keep it fun, trying my hand at making a video that evokes a lot of emotion, creating my first ever real travel video, and of course making a couple random things like an iPad unboxing. At this stage, I felt a bit more comfortable throwing some random things at the wall because I finally had a decent sized audience that came to me for me through my Ivy League and consulting videos rather than in phase two when they came to me from Graham's podcast. And even during this phase when I had quite a few subscribers, I still responded to every single comment. And at this point, I really started to feel a sense of purpose because I was having a lot of people tell me how much I'd helped them go through the college application process or the interview prep process for a consulting job. And having a sense of purpose is huge for motivation. We'll talk about it more in a little bit. And a reminder to thumbs up this video if you feel so inclined. So anyway, about two months into this phase, I started my full-time job as a consultant in April, 2021. Yeah, remember that thing, my full-time job that I had you know, 1.5 years prior before actually starting, and then the start date got pushed back two more times because of COVID. First day, first day at work, first day at work. Are you gonna help me? You really should dial in for me. You should dial in for me. You're much cuter. Yeah, that's you. That's you. My little helper. So even though I couldn't travel the world like I had planned, I seriously would not have it any other way. I would not have this channel or this newfound passion of mine if it were not for COVID. Not saying COVID was a good thing, but you know what I mean. So once I started my full-time job, I obviously had to deprioritize YouTube, which meant that I started posting a lot less frequently because I do all of my own script writing, filming, editing, posting, which is still the case to this day. And even though I had started my consulting job, which yes, was one of my competitive advantages as we have discussed, who wants to talk about their day job that much? You know, like when I had a break from actual work, it was the last thing that I wanted to talk about. Plus I wanted to be at the job for at least a few months and have some real experience under my belt before like really talking about it on YouTube. Also, my consulting job was in New York and I was still at home in LA working New York hours during this time. I was gonna move to New York eventually, of course, but I really wasn't in a rush because we didn't have to be in person in the office and I was just having a great time in LA, spending more time with my family and my dogs and saving money on rent. <laughs> but eventually it came time to move to New York. Enter phase four. I finally moved to New York City in September of 2021, so almost a year ago. However, I was so busy with work and with settling into the city, both physically and emotionally, that I didn't really start talking about New York or my job all that much until three months after moving here. And then eventually I put out this video. Day in my life as a consultant. This was my first ever viral video and the video to this day that has single-handedly grown my channel the most. That's right, it's this one, not this one. Interesting, isn't it? We will get into why that is. So I explained the ins and outs of why certain videos convert more viewers into subscribers than other types of videos, but it just went on for way too long. Long story short, the average demographic watching a consulting related video is a lot more likely to subscribe compared to the average demographic watching a New York City apartment tour video. The insights around 
background this topic can be pretty helpful to understand when it comes to YouTube growth strategies, so I can talk about that more in the future if you want, but until then, I will leave you with this and give you two minutes of your life back. But yes, this video literally doubled my channel from 20,000 subscribers to 40,000. And this brings me to the importance of viral videos. Now, while you ideally experience steady growth between your videos, it is usually these one-off viral videos that will grow your subscriber count the most, and I'm sure that's not surprising. But my point here is that it's worth studying what makes a video go viral. Some video idea that you probably know will get a lot of views based off of the landscape of other YouTube videos and analyzing how your own videos do based off the topic, etc. To be fair though, did I know that my consulting video would go viral? Not really. I did think it would get quite a few views because I saw that day in the life of a consultant videos tended to do pretty well most of the time, but I did not expect this many views. So it's really not all that calculated. And to be honest with you, I don't even think it's that good of a video. I mean, it's fine. It's just not up to my standards today of what I think makes an engaging video, but you live and you learn. I wanted to lean into the momentum that I gained from that day in my life as a consultant video. So then I made these two videos and the hard work on these two paid off as well. This one specifically ate up a good portion of my winter break. I spent pretty much the whole week between Christmas and New Year's sitting in a coffee bean when the sun was going down at 4 p.m. and it was nippy outside, writing the script to this video. Hello, editing Taylor here, popping in to make a point. Heh <laughs> vanilla wafers. I just think this part is kind of sort of coming off as, ooh, look at me, look how hard I worked. In reality, my point here is that my journey to 100,000 subscribers was so not overnight. It took a lot of time and effort, and I'm just trying to highlight the videos to you guys that I think kind of helped me get there. During this phase, I also put out my very first official New York City vlog, a whole four months after moving there because it finally started to feel like home. I also put out a strictly personal finance video afterwards because at that point I'd been working my consulting job for a full year and I finally understood the difference between traditional versus Roth 401ks, Roth RAs, other retirement vehicles like the HSA, and I also found some ETFs with lower expense ratios than the one I talked about in my prior personal finance video. Anyway, and then came my other viral video, my apartment tour. I didn't make this video until six months after moving in. Partially because I was lazy, partially because I wanted my room to come together a bit more before filming it, but mainly because I didn't have someone here to film me where I would feel 100% comfortable letting my personality let loose. But once those things came together, I finally made that video. It's also during this phase that I finally started taking on sponsorships in just about every video because before this point, I really wasn't being reached out to by companies that I could confidently get behind. And then it all kind of happened very fast from there. It really snowballed and within a month, pretty much, I had this whole new substantial income stream. Sponsors is a whole nother topic though. I'll save that for another time. But ever since that apartment tour video and the consulting video, I've really just been riding the wave and honing in on my video making skills. Then I quit my consulting job, but before announcing that I quit, I stopped talking about consulting almost entirely for months to see if my channel would take a hit. And when I saw that my channel did not take a hit, that's when I announced it. And then when I went YouTube full time, I started putting out basically one video a week and really taught myself how to get better at editing and make a more engaging video because I finally had the time to dedicate to it. And here we are today. So I guess the tip there is to quit your job. <laughs> I am totally kidding. I should probably cut that out. That's irresponsible. But seriously, I should say this. I did not quit my consulting job until my YouTube income surpassed my consulting income. And that is generally what I would recommend for most people. Let's also not forget that I am still gonna go back to a corporate job in a couple months. So clearly I still think there's a lot of value to be had there. So some final overall tips that arise from this final phase. I would recommend that you study YouTube as a platform and learn how it works as soon as you start a channel. Of course, the algorithm is a mystery in many ways and it always will be, but if you can teach yourself how to use the algorithm to your advantage, that can go a long way. For example, learning what type of content is searchable, learning how to use keywords to your advantage for search engine optimization. There's a bunch of things here. And another tip I would have is learning the value of keywords keeping things private. For example, as discussed, I kept the fact that I quit my consulting job private for months, not just for optics, but to really test out how my channel would do if I didn't have consulting to talk about. And there was a lot of value in being able to run that experiment rather than just falling privy to the knee jerk reaction of putting out the, I quit my job video the day that I gave my notice. I also keep my love life and my very personal life private. Obviously take what you will with this tip, but do try to realize the benefits of keeping certain aspects of your life private. Final tip, do a deep evaluation of your own channel or someone else's channel. Even making this video and categorizing what I think are the different phases that my channel has gone through, what I did well, what I could have done better, 
It's honestly been immensely helpful for my own purposes. I can also see it being helpful in the future if I ever feel like I'm in a rut, which inevitably happens. Sometimes I can look back, see what worked for me and try to draw inspiration from that. All right, quick summary of the phases and the tips. If you want more detail, go back and actually watch the video, but here's the summary. Phase number one was from August 20th, 2020 to November 21st, 2020, which was a period of 93 days. During this period, I gained 448 subscribers. If you are one of these, you are a true OG. Level one OG. Let me know in the comments if you're a level one OG. During this period, I started my YouTube channel specifically within the reselling niche. Tips from this phase include starting your channel by talking about something that you are very passionate about for various reasons, sharing your first video everywhere, even if it feels embarrassing, and leaving genuine comments on other YouTubers channels. Phase number two was from November 22nd, 2020 until February 25th, 2021, which was a period of 95 days. In this period, I gained 7,798 subscribers. During this phase, totally through luck, I went on Graham Stephan's podcast, which gave me a whole new audience. While overall, I think this was a great thing, it was definitely inorganic growth and it left me feeling a little bit directionless on where I wanted to take my channel. So my only tip during this phase was to respond to every single comment that you get to start really building those authentic connections with your audience. Phase three was from February 26, 2021 until December 18th, 2021, which was a 295 day period. And during this time, I gained 12,176 subscribers. During this phase, I analyzed what my competitive advantages were. So I started making videos about my Ivy League experience and my consulting job, which led to some organic growth of my subscriber base because I was actually delivering value in my videos. So two tips from this phase. The first was to figure out what your competitive advantages are. And the second is to deliver value, whether that means you're teaching something new or providing entertainment or anything in between. Phase four is from December 19th, 2021 until present day, which so far is a period of 226 days and counting. In this period, I have gained 105,686 subscribers. During this phase, I moved to New York City and came out with a couple viral videos that really accelerated the growth of my channel. I also quit my job and started doing YouTube full-time. Tips here included to learn how YouTube and its algorithm works, learning the value of keeping certain things private, and to do a deep evaluation of your own channel or someone else's channel. And the final portion of the video, the giveaway. I also noodled on what type of giveaway to do for so long. A lot of YouTubers give away money or merch I don't know. So I wanted to take this opportunity to crowdsource, but also to make connections with you guys on a deeper level. So here's what we're gonna do. I have my rules written down here. Leave a comment down below on what you like most about my content and what you wanna see more of moving forward. Please feel free to throw in constructive criticism. In fact, I encourage that. Don't be mean about it, but you know, I really am all ears, seriously. And at the end of your comment, if you live in the United States, leave your Instagram handle. So, uh, you know, right, 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 right. At the very end, at TayKBell. Follow me on Instagram, by the way. <laughs> I will read through the comments and choose the ones that I like the most or that I find the most helpful. I will DM you on Instagram and ask for your mailing address, and then I will send you a handwritten letter. That's right, I'm 60 years old. No, it might sound a little silly. It, it is a little silly, but I just really love handwriting notes and letters to people. I just think it's a really beautiful form of communication that should not die. And I'll choose a bunch of you, I promise. I'm ready to write a bunch of notes. For the sake of postage, for the handwritten letters, you do have to be in the US. But even if you're not in the US, please still leave a comment. I will do my best to read and respond to every single one. Just don't put your Instagram handle at the end unless you're in the US. I also wanna help you guys in any way that I can. So I will also choose a number of you to grab coffee with here in New York City so we can talk about whatever. So if that sounds good to you, you're in the US and you're in New York City and you'd wanna grab coffee, just put a Statue of Liberty emoji at the very end of your comment after your Instagram handle. And finally, I will save you guys the long rant because I know you'll click off, but I just wanna say I am so grateful for this. It is seriously nothing short of a dream come true. And the cringe got way too strong. So here's a parting kiss. I love you all. Like and subscribe if you made it this far. And until next time, turtle out. Uh, I'll wait for the people to save someone else's life, you know. Things we do for views. <laughs>